Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to drink from the fire hose of knowledge as we take a deep dive into one of the most critical aspects of computer operating systems, kernel mode. Did you know that your computer could be running up to about 30% faster if it weren't for certain vulnerabilities lurking deep within its core? I'm talking about the infamous Spectre and Meltdown attacks that shook the tech world a few years back. These were kernel-level vulnerabilities so severe that they forced hardware and software makers to implement fixes. Fixes that unfortunately came with a performance cost. Understanding how kernel mode operates isn't just tech trivia. It's key to grasping why your system sometimes isn't as speedy as it could be and how it's kept secure from some of the most dangerous cyber threats out there. From high-stakes security breaches to why your game might be lagging due to anti-cheat engines operating at the kernel level, the concepts of kernel and user modes are at the heart of it all. The recent CrowdStrike outage that took down millions of machines worldwide was a failure in a kernel mode component. If it wasn't in kernel mode, almost nobody would have noticed. But in kernel mode, it brought many industries to a halt. Let's find out why. Imagine your computer as a bustling city. In this city, there's the public area where everybody roams freely. Think parks, cafes, and shops. This is like user mode, where all your everyday applications run. They're sandboxed for safety, so if one app crashes, the rest of the city keeps humming along without a hitch. But then there's the restricted zone. The power plants, police stations, and control centers. This is kernel mode, the heart of your operating system where it interacts directly with your hardware. If something goes wrong here, it's not just a fender mender, it's a citywide blackout. And that's exactly what happened with Spectre and Meltdown. Attackers found a way into the control room, exploiting how CPUs handle speculative execution to access privileged information. Basically, they looked in the side window. The fallout? To protect the city's core, operating systems had to erect new barriers and checkpoints, which unfortunately slowed down the flow of traffic. And that's why your system might feel a bit sluggish compared to its true potential. But why should you care about kernel and user modes? Because they impact everything from your system's security and stability to its overall performance. And understanding this can help you appreciate the intricate balancing act that keeps your computer running smoothly. So why do operating systems even need two modes? Well, think of it as a safety barrier. User mode is where applications run in isolation from each other and from the core system resources. It's like having your apps confined to, as they say, a sandbox. They can play around and do what they're supposed to do, but if one of them tries to get out of line, saying to corrupt your hard drive or access data from another app, kernel mode steps in. It says, hold on, you don't have permission to do that. The operating system, like a good city planner, keeps things safe by limiting what user mode applications can actually touch or see. But when we're talking about kernel mode, there are no such restrictions. The operating system and its core drivers are free to touch any part of the system that they want. That's powerful, but it's also dangerous. If something bad happens in kernel mode, like a rogue driver causing a memory error, it can take the entire operating system down in an instant. Let's take a moment to compare Windows and Linux here. Both use the concept of kernel mode and user mode, but the way they approach their kernels differs slightly. Both Windows and Linux use monolithic kernels that support loadable modules. That means that in both systems, drivers and certain services can be loaded and unloaded without rebooting. However, Windows historically includes more proprietary drivers and services running in kernel mode, which can increase the risk of system instability. Linux, being open source, often encourages running services in user space where possible, reducing the amount of code in kernel space and potentially enhancing system stability. Now, why does this all matter? Well, every time you boot up your computer, it's switching between kernel mode and user mode constantly. And most of the time, things go smoothly because of decades of refinement. But when something goes wrong in kernel mode, when a driver crashes or a memory bug gets triggered, the whole system can come crashing down. That's why hardware drivers are usually so meticulously tested and why most of your applications, which aren't trusted with direct hardware access, stay safely in user mode. Kernel mode is where the magic happens, but it's also where all the risk lives. User mode is safe, but limited. So let's dig deeper into these modes and how they interact with each other and what happens when they collide. So picture this. You're sitting at your computer, happily browsing the web, typing away in Word, and maybe listening to some music. All of those tasks are happening in user mode, safely isolated from the core of your system. But what if one of those tasks suddenly needs something that user mode can't handle, like accessing your hard disk or sending data through the network card? Well, that's where kernel mode comes into play. Here's how it works. When an application in user mode needs to perform a task that requires direct hardware access, like saving to a file, it sends a system call to the operating system. 
Think of a system call as a formal request to the city's control room saying, hey, I need something that does this, and I need it to do it at this time and return this. The operating system running in kernel mode evaluates the request, and if it's safe to perform it, performs the task on behalf of the user mode application. The kernel still has to take into account all the important aspects, like whether or not you actually have access to the file, whether the file is already locked for writing, and so on. Once it's done, control is handed back to user mode, and your app continues chugging along like nothing happened. It's a coordinated dash between two worlds. User mode, where things are kept safe and isolated, and kernel mode, where the real power lies. But sometimes that dance can get messy. Take drivers, for instance. Drivers are small pieces of software that act as translators between your operating system and hardware on your machine. Things like your graphics card, sound chip, or network card. But here's the kicker. Drivers usually run in kernel mode because they need to interact directly with hardware. And that means if a driver has a bug, things can go south quickly. If a network driver gets corrupted, it's not just your internet connection that suffers. It will take the whole system down with it. And that's why it's so important for drivers to be well-written and rigorously tested. In the worst case scenario, a bad driver can lead to what we all dread, the blue screen of death. It's essentially the computer waving a white flag saying, I've encountered a critical error in kernel mode and so I can't continue. It's the digital equivalent of an entire city blackout because the control room systems went haywire. Now what about the other side of the coin? How do we keep things safe in user mode? Well, operating systems use several techniques to make sure that user mode applications don't step out of line. One of the most common is virtual memory. In simple terms, every application running in user mode is given its own little piece of memory to play with and it's isolated from other applications. Even if it tries to, one app cannot see into the memory of another app, nor can it make any changes to it. And this is all enforced at the hardware level by your CPU's Memory Management Unit, or MMU. More important, it means that if one app crashes or does something rogue, it doesn't take down your entire system. The other apps just keep running, oblivious to the fact that something went wrong. In contrast, kernel mode has full access to the entire system's memory model, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's necessary for things like the heap manager to function, but it also means that mistakes in kernel mode can corrupt critical parts of the system's memory, leading to crashes or data loss. This brings us to another major difference between how Windows and Linux handle kernel and user mode. In Windows, because more functionality is packed into the kernel, like certain drivers and services, there's more opportunity for something to go wrong in kernel mode. It's like running a big city with a sprawling, huge control room. It's powerful, but it's also prone to bottlenecks and failures. Linux, on the other hand, takes a more distributed approach. By allowing drivers to be loaded as modules, you're not burdening the kernel with everything at once. And in theory, if something goes wrong with a driver in Linux, you can unload that module and reload it without taking down the whole system. Think of it as pulling a faulty component out of the control room and swapping it for a new one without shutting off the city's power. But here's a fun fact. Even Linux isn't immune to kernel panics, which is their version of the blue screen of death. When it happens, the system throws up its hands and freezes or dumps its core and reboots. It's less dramatic than the colorful blue screen on Windows, but the result is the same. A complete system halt with no choice but to reboot. Now let's talk about performance. Kernel mode operates with the highest level of privilege, allowing direct access to hardware and system resources. This can make certain low-level operations more efficient as there's less overhead from context switches between user mode and kernel mode. However, this doesn't mean that all tasks run faster in kernel mode. The kernel still needs to manage resources carefully and maintain system stability and security. However, running more things in kernel mode isn't always better. Windows often gets flack for having too much bloat in its kernel, services and drivers that could arguably be shifted to user mode. It's kind of like having too many people crammed into that city's control room all trying to do different things at once. Linux, by contrast, keeps things relatively lean by offloading some of the functionality to user mode, only dipping into kernel mode when more necessary. So what happens when things go wrong in kernel mode? Well, when the system can't recover, whether it's due to a bad driver, memory corruption, or an actual hardware failure, it performs what's called a kernel crash dump. This is where the system takes a snapshot of all the memory in the system and the CPU state to show what was happening right before things went south. That way, when you reboot, you can examine the crash dump to figure out what went wrong. It's a bit like investigating a plane crash. You're trying to piece together the chain of events that led up to the disaster. Back when I was working on Windows, it was pretty common practice to take a crash dump file and connect a debugger to it. From there, you can analyze the machine state, the call stack, and so on. 
We're getting deeper into the nitty gritty of how kernel mode and user mode interact. But in the next part, we're gonna wrap things up by exploring some real world examples of kernel mode disasters and why these systems are built the way they are and how modern operating systems protect us from the chaos of a kernel meltdown. So let's look at some real world examples of what happens when things go wrong and why the architecture is built this way and how modern systems are getting even better at keeping your system safe. One notable example of malware exploiting kernel mode privileges is the Stuxnet worm discovered back in 2010. While Stuxnet wasn't just about kernel mode exploitation, it did use that as part of its sophisticated attack strategy. Stuxnet was designed to target industrial control systems, specifically those used in Iran's nuclear program. One of its key features was its ability to inject code into the kernel of Windows systems, allowing it to hide its presence and manipulate system operations at the lowest level. The malware used multiple zero-day vulnerabilities to gain access to systems. Once installed, it exploited a vulnerability in the Windows Task Scheduler, not Task Manager, to elevate its privileges to kernel mode. Operating in kernel mode allowed Stuxnet to do four key things. One, to hide its files from the file system. Number two, to intercept and modify system calls. Number three, to prevent detection by antivirus or anti-malware software. And number four, to control the execution of other processes. The Stuxnet case highlighted the extreme potency of malware that can operate at the kernel level, demonstrating how such access can be leveraged to carry out highly sophisticated and targeted attacks. It also served as a wake-up call to the cybersecurity community about the potential for state-sponsored cyber weapons to target critical infrastructure. When something misbehaves in user mode, the system can usually catch it, kill off the offending app, and then carry on. But as noted, when things go wrong in kernel mode, the entire system comes crashing down. And that's why security updates are so crucial, especially those marked as critical. They're often patching vulnerabilities that, if exploited, could let something like the Stuxnet worm or the Blaster worm take over your system's core. So, how have things improved since then? Well, modern operating systems have gotten much better at protecting the kernel from unwanted intrusions. One key innovation in recent years is a feature called Kernel Patch Protection or Patch Guard in Windows. This system makes it much harder for third-party software to modify the Windows kernel, which was a big vector for attacks in the past. Think of it as adding armed guards at the door of the control room, making sure that only trusted personnel get inside. In Linux, the focus has been on tightening up the permission structure for modules and drivers. Linux uses something called Linux Security Modules, which provides a framework to enforce security policies at the kernel level. For example, SE Linux, or Security Enhanced Linux, can be configured to tightly control which programs can access certain parts of the kernel, making it more difficult for an attacker to elevate privileges and take control. But modern systems don't just stop at securing kernel mode. They actively sandbox processes and use advanced techniques to isolate potential threats. Remember how earlier I mentioned virtual memory as a way to keep user mode applications isolated from each other? Well, modern systems have taken this concept even further with something called hypervisors and virtualization. Hypervisors, like the one used in virtual machines, allow entire operating systems to run inside a virtualized environment isolated from the host system. It's like kernel mode on steroids. You can think of it as creating a miniature little city inside the main city, complete with its own control room, where if something goes wrong, it's contained within that little city. And this is exactly how many cloud systems today protect their infrastructure. Companies like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft run thousands upon thousands of their machines on virtual cloud servers, all isolated from one another using hypervisors. If one virtual machine has a kernel mode failure, it doesn't affect the rest of the running system. It's like having a quarantine zone in the city. This kind of isolation has become a key part of modern security strategies, especially as we move more and more into cloud computing. Let's take a step back, though, and look at why operating systems have stuck with this kernel and user mode division for so long. Why not just give everything kernel mode access and be done with it? Well, the answer lies in the delicate balance between power and stability. Kernel mode is fast and the access is direct and powerful, there's no denying that, but it's also fragile. Give too many things the access to kernel mode and the likelihood of something going wrong just increases. On the other hand, user mode is much safer but less capable. This balance has led to the evolution of some systems like microkernels, an architecture where the kernel is kept as small as possible, and most system functions like drivers run in user mode instead of in kernel mode. An example of a microkernel is Minix, the operating system famously used in Intel's management engine, which is a small, isolated part of the processor that can manage the system even if the main operating system crashes. By keeping its kernel tiny, microkernel systems reduce the risk of catastrophic failure. It's like running a city with a minimalist control room. Fewer people, fewer risks. But every time they want to do something, they may have to go outside to get approval or help. 
So it's always a trade-off. And that's why we don't just switch to microkernels. When you offload more tasks to user mode, the system needs to make more frequent contact switches between kernel and user mode, which adds overhead. And that's why many popular operating systems like Windows and Linux stick to the monolithic kernel approach. They found the right balance between power and safety for their markets. So what's the key takeaway here? Well, kernel mode and user mode are like two halves of a carefully constructed system, balancing power and safety to keep your system running smoothly. Kernel mode is where the magic and the danger happens, but thanks to innovations in security, virtualization, and sandboxing, operating systems are getting better at keeping the chaos in check. Whether you're running a monolithic kernel like Windows or Linux, or experimenting with something more modular like a microkernel, the goal is always the same. To give you, the user, the best experience possible while minimizing the risk of catastrophic failure. If you found today's episode to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like on the video. And if you're already a subscriber, be sure to check out my second channel, Dave's Attic, where you can find our weekly podcast that goes live every Friday at 4 p.m. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum. It's intended for folks that do not have a diagnosis, but who suspect they might have a few traits in common with the spectrum. It's everything I know now about living a great life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it, do it! <laughs>